Before we get going, could you do me a massive favor and press the follow or subscribe button wherever you listen to the podcast? You'll be actively helping the podcast to develop and grow, so I'll be really grateful. Vision and Graft, a career and resilience companion with Richard William Preisner. Hello, and thank you for joining me on episode 13 of the Vision and Graft podcast. I'm Richard William Preisner. I'm a freelance cinematographer and photographer. I'm going to start with an exciting announcement that I've um, I've got this week in collaboration with Roscoe and um, in unison with the release of this episode, I have created a tool um, where you can compare different types of diffusion material from Roscoe's e-color range and from their Roscoe text ranges. It's an online based tool um, and it can also be installed as like an app or shortcut on an iPhone and Android device. And to access this tool, if you go to my website, rwprisner.com forward slash diffusion, it's kind of designed for cinematographers, photographers, filmmakers, lighting professionals, gaffers, sparks, you know, anyone who's involved in lighting and whether in film or even theatre, anyone who needs to modify lights and considers using different types of diffusion, you basically can compare 20 different types of light and diffusion on there. I'm hoping it will be useful for people's work. I've designed it as kind of like a quick access tool. And I'm going to be using it in my work, so it'd be great if anyone else can. And if you just click on Diffusion at VisionGraph.com, that will take you to it, and um, and you'll be able to follow the instructions about how to use it. If anyone's getting any feedback, please do get in touch. Also, in collaboration with Roscoe, there's a free competition that you can enter in this episode to win a Roscoe mix book. The details are at the break. It's super easy to enter. It's free. It'll probably take you like 30 seconds to a minute, if that, to enter. So that's two exciting announcements this week. And the third exciting announcement is that my guest is the cinematographer, David Proctor, BSC, who is very talented. He's known for shooting Disney's Black Beauty, which is currently on Disney+. Plus. He shot the Innocence series, which is on Netflix at the moment as well. He shot so many commercials that I'd be here all day if I was listing through them, but you're bound to have seen them wherever you are in the world. It's like very top level commercials. He's been a, a bit of a mentor to me over, over the years and very generous with his advice and thoughts and knowledge. And in this episode, there is no, no difference there. He's very forthcoming in sharing his experiences and his knowledge. And he gives great advice for um, aspiring cinematographers and filmmakers in general from the very first few moments of our conversation. So it's dense with advice um, for, like say, filmmakers and cinematographers, but also creatives in general will take something away from this for sure, because um, David's working at such a high level. There's lots to learn. To check out David's work and access the diffusion tool that I mentioned earlier, you can um, access the show notes again at visiongraph.com and just click on the episode link at the top. Well, that's enough of me talking. So let's now move on swiftly to the conversation with David Proctor, BSC. What inspired you to become a cinematographer and what's the journey been like so far? So if I'm honest, in my sort of education, in my youth, I didn't have any concept that you could work in the film industry. That was like something of a distant fantasy. My education was very much like, are you going to be a doctor or a lawyer? Are you going to work in banking or insurance? It was that kind of academic background I came from. But I was always more artistically inclined, so I didn't really fit into my school that well. I started pushing more into art and design work. I went to Ravensbourne where I did a foundation. And it was while I was there that I was exploring all of these different paths that one can take in the creative industries. And in doing so, one of those sections was lens-based media. And I basically fell in love with shooting 35mm film and developing that in a lab and that sort of tactile quality of image capture. And we also would make short projects, you know, on, I think at the time it was like mini DV was kind of the resources we had. And we'd go out and make these short films and edit them and, and cut them to music. And, and it just, as soon as I realized that was a job that could actually be uh, what you would do to pay your bills. For me, that was just a no brainer. It was like, well, this is, this is something I need to pursue. So I went on, did three year degree in television and film design, moved straight to London with not a single contact in the industry. So I didn't have a tenuous link through a, you know, distant uncle's relationship with someone. I didn't have anything. So I just moved to London and started hustling, started going to film festivals, networking events, networking nights. I'd specialised in cinematography on my degree. I went to an NFTS where I did a short course in, in basically loading, but in film and 16, 35 mil, which enabled me to sort of get the bare knowledge I needed to start playing with film and I was working as an operator I was going out on documentary projects and my early days were all documentary so I managed to sort of connect myself to certain directors that I'd studied with and new directors I've met through the film industry 
through the sort of the film festival circuit is what I mean to say by doing so just kind of slowly clawed my way in obviously as I said earlier I, I made a relationship with uh, Rental House the late Filmscape Media and sort of by being on their radar and sort of helping them out on three days I'd get equipment sometimes at weekends if they had it on shelves and they were very supportive and I quickly realized that a lot of the facilities houses out there are very supportive of, of new talent. You know, they want to build that relationship as much as you do. So I'd find myself in a situation where I could get lights and cameras and things by begging and pleading. And then when I got paid work, I'd take it to those people and return the favor. It's a reciprocal relationship. So the scale of projects grew and I traveled more and more to film festivals where I had stuff screening used to get myself like Wizz Air and EasyJet flights all over Europe to, you know, even small festivals because you never know who you'd meet. And by doing that, I met more and more directors, quickly realised that you don't get many cinematographers at film festivals. They tend to be very, very dominantly producers and directors. So as a cinematographer at film festival, you're kind of in a perfect place to network and, and meet new collaborators. You've also got a captive audience to be like, hey, come and see my film. I know you're here. So, you know, people are going to see your work on the big screen. And those relationships build and that's how I got a lot of my early work was through those relationships and the cost of that might have been you know a 50 quid flight to northern Italy or to southern Spain or wherever I was they'd often put you up and look after you when you're there so yeah that was kind of the hustle sort of getting my way in and learning and um yeah I did go out as an assistant as well um I was a terrible focus puller for a tiny moment and I think it was through that I just realized that shooting was much more suited to me the storytelling side is what got me into film in the first place and um yeah that's kind of what I wanted to pursue so in an ideal world I would have loved to work as an operator for a, a number of years but that wasn't on the table for me that opportunity didn't present itself when I, I first started kind of chatting to you you'd just got an agent and it seemed like that point just you exploded out the traps and were doing like loads of work and traveling a lot. And it seems like that's been fairly relentless besides COVID it's up until now. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a, there's a general misconception with many in the industry that people have these huge jumps, these career defining moments where you jump a level, you jump a rung of the ladder, or maybe you skip rungs of the ladder. And I think the reality is for most people as individuals in their own sort of careers, it never really does happen that way. You know, everything's a tiny step. You feel like you've just had this milestone moment, this pivotal moment. And I think for me, one incidence of that was when I was at Venice Film Festival in, I believe, 2015 or 14. And I had Bypass and Blood Cells, two feature films, um, screening and competition. And I thought to myself, you know, this is me. I've landed in the drama world. This is it. This is going to be a change, a pivotal moment in my career. And in reality, nothing changed. Like nothing changed at all. You know, some more offers come through, things happen, but not really. There was never some, there's not been a single moment in my career that's like, okay, this has changed. They're just always small steps. And um, your career as a cinematographer is just a very slow, gradual climb. And, you know, I've still got a long way to go. I've come a long way in 15 years, 10 years, but it's never been big jumps. It always feels very controlled, very contained. And really, that's it. I think for me to have got from indie film through to a film on the scale of Black Beauty to do a, a studio film like that was because of my body of work in commercials. You know, I've been exposed to some very high budget commercials through my career. And by dealing with those scales of productions and sizes of sets and those responsibilities of teams that large, you're kind of becoming well-versed in the management side and the pressure dealing side that you need for a studio film of that size. So I think for me, there's always been this kind of hybrid in my career of drama and commercials and short form. And I've always tried to keep a balance there. I'm wondering to what extent you feel you've had a hand in carving your own career, kind of like seeking out the projects that you want to do, as opposed to kind of that are just being given to you in both commercials and drama, and whether it's kind of been fortunate that these the projects that you have done have landed on your desk, or it's as a result of you going out and getting them. How do you feel that balance is? Ultimately, I think we're in charge of the shape and design of our own careers. And for me, that's been a very careful collaboration with my agents. Um, so with Wizzo in Europe and with WPA in America, it's been a, a constant dialogue in regards to every single project I take. There's never a throwaway project where it's like, oh yeah, go on, I'm, I'm free this week, I'll take it. For me, there needs to be a real reason to do that project. And I think 
by being selective, it enables you to become more selective. You know, it's kind of a snowball effect in that respect. So you start taking the type of work you want to be doing and it breeds more of the same type of work. So for me, there's no coincidences in, in any of it for me. I'm definitely more interested in film than I am television. And in the drama side of things, on the film side, I'm very much drawn to issues-based filmmaking. I like the power of cinema in, as a tool for social and political commentary. And that's something I've often spoke about. And my early drama work was all issues based. I took a slight diversion away from that when I did The Innocence for, for Netflix. But that was just kind of a step I felt I wanted to take. And I, I liked uh, director Farron Blackburn's work and everything just kind of aligned there. And I think across the board, my agents felt that that was the right thing to do as a project. And Black Beauty was, you know, it's a family film, which is not necessarily my sort of field of interest. But what I liked about the project when I first met director Ashley Avis was the issues-based nature of it, was the fact that she was taking a classical novel by Anna Sewell, which essentially exists to raise awareness of the treatment of horses. Obviously, it was originally set in Victorian England. And what Ashley was doing was transplanting that narrative to North America, to a contemporary North America, to, again, raise awareness of the treatment of horses in North America. So she actually updated its relevance socially. So for me, that was actually my main draw with the film. I mean, obviously, I knew there was opportunity for great imagery. I saw a lot of shared sensibility with Ashley's other work. And so I felt that she was a director that I'd get along with very well. I liked her emotive approach to storytelling. And from our first meeting, I knew she was someone that I'd have a really good time working with. So that's kind of how that came about. But the reality is there's big gaps between my dramatic projects. And that's just because I, it's such a huge piece of you that you put into a film, that you put into a TV series. And for me, I'm not very good at maintaining my life work balance when I'm on a long form project. I go into a bit of a bubble, the blinkers go on and friends, family, weddings, birthdays, events, fitness, health, hobbies, it all just goes in a box until I finish that production. And that's not something I can do very often for my own sort of mental and physical health. For me, like when I come on board a long form project, I need to really believe in it. I need to really feel it's something special. And it's safe to say a project that does ticks all those boxes has not come along since Black Beauty. Obviously, we've been in the pandemic and there's been some interesting projects, but the projects I'm all attached to now are projects that tick those boxes. They're projects that I find interesting, compelling, films I think need to be made. And I think on a short form side, whether you're selling fast food or insurance or gambling, whatever it is, there needs to be a creative spark. There needs to be something that interests you about that project aesthetically and creatively. Often that's the director. Often that's the director whose work you admire and you want to collaborate with this person, this artist. Maybe you love the script, maybe you love the treatment, but there's kind of, for me, there's a triangle that I try to kind of fulfill two things within that triangle. So one is kind of, one is the director, one is the script or the treatment, the creative behind an idea. And then the third one is life effect. So that might be that it's a very convenient job that's like nearby, you nearby your home, that you get to use all of your local London crew, that it's well paid. And that might just be like a, a good life effect thing. And you might love the director, but you don't like the script. So you're like, well, you know what? I get to use all my team. I get to, you know, work really lovely hours and do a really nice job with a really good director, but actually I don't really like the treatment. And you're kind of then, well, you're like, well, it ticks two of my two of the boxes of my triangle. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for that. On the flip side, you might have a really good director, a really good script, but it's like shooting in somewhere you really don't want to go to and you're gonna be away for a period of time. And maybe it's not even paid, maybe it's a freebie, but it's a great script and it's a great director. It's like, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it anyway. It ticks those two boxes. And there's any infinite variance of what I'm saying. You know, maybe it's a maybe it's a great treatment shooting in a place you really want to go and work. So, you know, it might be shooting in in Namibia. It might be shooting in Namibia. It might be a place you've always dreamt to go. It might be a really good script or treatment. But maybe you're not that sure on the director's work and you're like, well, it ticks these things. I'd quite like to explore this. And you know, maybe it's going to be okay. So for me, it's all about this kind of decision making process. And for me, I think something I should be very clear about is that's not a decision I make on my own. That's the decision that I 
feel has been an integral relationship for me, which is my relationship with my agents and them understanding me as an artist and where I want to be and what I want to be doing. And someone that supports you to say, you know what, this like freebie charity job is actually way more interesting than this 10 day car commercial in South America. And I'm going to do this freebie charity job because I believe in it and I believe in the creative and I believe in the director and that's just what I want to be doing. And you want an agent that supports you in that and isn't thinking about finances. Those those agents definitely exist and I'm very lucky to have them. So, Yeah, I suppose it takes you out of the sort of like echo chamber of just being on your own and having that like sounding board and someone else who's got like your best interests at heart, not just financial interests. I suppose it's really rewarding to have that. I think it's really important. And I, and I also think, you know, they can see you and your reputation and your knowledge objectively. So there's been occasions where, not really lately, but there's been occasions in my earlier days with Wizzo particularly, where there may have been a job that I was a little bit tentative, a little bit nervous about. And, you know, Lee would be very clear, sort of say, you know, you, you should do this. It's, it's going to be great. You're going to do a really good job. And it maybe it's the scale of it or the technicality of that particular job what I was nervous about and therefore wanted to kind of step away from. But, you know, having that support and that, that person who's got your back and they, they really believe in you is really integral. And that's really helped me develop as a, as a cinematographer. How is having a passion for what you do important to you and your development as a creative? Fundamentally, success in the film industry in any field, be it a cinematographer, director, writer, whatever it is you're doing, is reliant on passion. You need to be so tenacious to just turn up, knock back after knock back, rejection after rejection. Because although we often see others' careers through rose tinted glasses, everyone has those same knockbacks. Every person that you see, your peers on, on Instagram, and you, you see their successes and you think, oh, they just got it on a plate. It just happens for them. Like job after job, great director after great director. It's very easy to really misconceive the realities of another person's career and success. And the fact is, the passion is what keeps you going. The passion is what gets you up each day after a really rough week of knocks, backs and, and, and losses. And I can't go into details because of NDAs, but the amount of big jobs that I didn't land before Black Beauty, it's a list this long. And there's some really large blows along the way there where you're literally packing your suitcase to fly to North America for a job for a big film, and then it doesn't happen. And it's like, oh, oh, okay, great. It's the passion that just gets you back the next day. And I think the one difference between the people who make it and the people that don't is that they just don't give up. I mean, you do need knowledge, you do need skill, you do need talent, but there's so much within cinematography that's craft-based. You can learn that. You can learn the fundamentals of light. You can learn so many of the techniques of cinematography are science-based and you know, there's so many rules of cinematography around composition and, and the classical approach to cinematography. So much can be taught. Ultimately, sensibility and taste is that's something that's unique to you. And that's, what I think, what people talk about sometimes when they talk about, you know, someone who's got talent. It's like, what you mean is that you like their taste, ultimately. And taste is not something you can really learn, maybe. That's just something that you kind of, is inherent to you. But it's the, the passion is what, keeps you going every day and, and just makes you keep coming back blow after blow. And before you know it, you're, you're in your seventies and you're still working and you're like, all right, I've done it. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, it's, it's interesting what you're saying about taste as well. Cause I've often thought about this and like, wondered like, what exactly is that? Like, what, what is it that defines like my taste or style or, you know, if it's linked to my taste, what is that? I mean, personally, I feel like it's to do with how I'm emotionally reacting to the source material, it's all about my emotional reaction. And I think if people like my taste, I honestly, personally, I feel like it, they're liking what my emotional reaction to the source material is and how I'm presenting that for me, you know? I don't know what your view on that is. It's obviously quite a deep question. It is deep. And, and I think what you're saying is very true and definitely resonates. Every decision I make aesthetically is based on the script. And whether that script is a, a treatment for a commercial or whether it's a deep sort of dramatic narrative, still those decisions that I make come from that source. They come from that seed planted by the original sort of, you know, the original script. And ultimately, yeah, a lot of that decisions that you make, the way you decide to translate that story visually 
and the visual language you design for a piece, the visual grammar is definitely an emotional journey that you're, you know, what we do as cinematographers is manipulation. You know, there's no two ways about it. We are creating imagery to manipulate an audience to feel a particular thing. You know, you can be as purist as you like about it, but we are manipulators. And ultimately, what are you trying to make an audience feel? What are you trying to convey with the script? What's the scene really about? What's the feeling that you want to come through? And that then leads me to the palette, the color choices that I make, the time of day, the feel, the lens choice, the fall off, the depth of field. Composition is massive in terms of, you know, it's a, a emotional resonance and, and what the composition is doing and why. And all of these things come from that. They are an emotional level. But then I think when it comes to taste, there's certain things that we do or don't like. And that's something that I think you can see clearly within some cinematographer's work. And I think Roger Deakins is a really good example of someone who's an incredibly talented cinematographer, but someone who has a very distinctive style. And when I talk about style, I'm talking about taste. It's like he loves to shoot you know, shadow side, he's never going to shoot key side on anybody. You know, you rarely find a scene that he's shot in his body of work where he's shooting from key side. And that's something that he just likes. And I mean, I personally like that a lot. There's a lot of other cinematographers like that too. But then you might find other cinematographers that maybe prefer to be more raw, more real. And it's like, they're not going to fight the way the light's falling in a space. They're not going to change things around to have it lit in the way that they their taste wants it to be. There's no right or wrong. You know, it's a job of infinite possibilities, what we do. Yeah, I suppose it's an artistic endeavour, isn't it? And then at the end of the day, it's just down to opinion of whether someone likes it or not, as, as opposed to whether it's correct. There's nothing factually correct about it, is there? That's exactly right. I mean, you know, I absolutely love Roger Deakin's work. And he's shot some of my favourite pieces of cinematography through his career. But he does things very differently to what I do. And I love that. But I love what he does, but I couldn't do what he does. I work differently. You know, he loves to shoot with very far, very clean, very sharp lenses. He loves to shoot spherically. I like to shoot with really old, fucked up anamorphics. We're just into different things there. I still adore his work. That's just kind of one of the beauties of what we do, I think. Yeah, yeah. Variety is the spice of life after all, isn't it? That's it. How do you deal with the pressures of being a cinematographer? Ultimately, as cinematographers, yeah, it's a very it's a high pressured, high stress job in 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 many ways. But ultimately, something I remind myself every day on set is that actually, you know, we're not saving lives. I'm not a surgeon. I don't have someone's vital organs in my hands. You know, and that always calms me immeasurably. You know, that feeling of you know, what are we doing? We're creating entertainment. We're creating advertising we're telling stories, you know, there might be a high pressure scenario, there might be a lot of money at stake and a lot of pressure on a day, but actually it's not life or death, you know, and that's something that always grounds me quite heavily. And I think with the pressures of cinematography, the way cinematography as a career is kind of designed, I suppose, or (laughs) designed is probably the wrong word, but we're never thrown in the deep end in reality as a cinematographer because people will only get you on board projects that they know that you can handle, that they know you've done similar scales. So ultimately, you know, these rungs of the ladder that you climb as a cinematographer, they're always very small. You know, you're starting off on smaller jobs and then they grow, they grow, they grow, they grow. So for me, it's not like at one minute I'm on a, you know, two, three thousand pound music video and the next thing I'm shooting a Disney film. There was years and years and years between those things of building experience of dealing with those scenarios and those pressures and suddenly on the biggest days on Black Beauty, we had seven cameras and, uh, you know, a huge unit. You arrive at Unibase in the morning and you have that kind of slight flash of imposter syndrome of, you know, is this Burning Man? Oh, no, it's our unit base in the middle of the South African desert. And you just like, it's exciting, but you, you one can become overwhelmed by that. But I think the nature of the film industry, it's kind of designed that you're not put in those situations in the deep end. You've built to that slowly and gradually. So never really had a moment like that on set of of sort of panic of, oh my God, what, what am I doing? Why am I here? How did this happen? Because it's been a gradual process. Your jobs are just going from this budget to this budget, to this budget, to this budget, to this budget. And you know, your wealth of experience and traveling and all the different places you work, 
you're learning from those crews, learning from those producers, learning from those directors, and you're just always learning. So the pressure for me, like I say, that grounding moment is like, I'm not performing heart surgery today, which I think, I don't think anything could terrify me more than surgery, which is, I think, why that's something that I sort of am drawn back to. Like, nobody's life is in my hands, yet the safety of my team, but that's something different. I'm not directly manipulating someone's like health. So I find that very grounding and important to sort of remind yourself because people can be very stressful. I like to try to be. I endeavour to be the calmness on set. You know, I love to work with calm directors. I love to work with calm producers, but immeasurably, not immeasurably, but inevitably, I find myself sometimes working with people who maybe don't handle the stress quite so well. And um, they really do get agitated. It does get to them. You can see that they're not quite thinking clearly. And I try to be that kind of support beside them of just being calm under pressure because, you know, then you can solve anything. You can achieve anything. I think if you keep a clear mind and keep your temperament you know calm competition time if you're enjoying the conversation please can you do me a favor and leave me a review on apple podcasts it's super easy to do and if you let me know you've left a review using the get in touch page on visiongraft.com or by sending me a message on the vision and graft instagram at visiongraft you'll be automatically entered for free into one of the monthly draws to win a roscoe mixbook digital swatch book this very useful tool enables you to pre-visualize colored gels and LED colors, and they're really useful for those working in film, photography, or lighting design to plan which colors they could use in their lighting. I use mine all the time in my planning, and I couldn't be without it. Spread the word if any of your mates would be interested in getting their hands on one. The competition is free to enter. If you really want a mixed book and you'd like to increase your chances, if you repost any of my posts on the Vision & Graft Instagram to your story, I will add an extra entry into the competition for you if you let me know that you've done that. The last date for entry is midnight the 31st of August 2022, and I'll contact the winner directly to arrange their new mixed book delivery. The competition is only available to residents of the UK, EU, USA and Canada, but if you'd still like to leave me a review if you're outside of those areas, I will very much appreciate that. Full terms and conditions are available at visiongraph.com. Good luck with the competition. Now back to the show. One issue I think a lot of creators face is that they can have a client or a creative partner of sorts that they've worked with for a while or for a period of time. And then suddenly the work from that source kind of dries up without much explanation or they kind of take a turn in a different direction working with new people. And it's happened to me before and it's kind of, I've instinctively looked to blame myself for some reason that, you know, we mentioned feedback. If I've not had feedback or I've not managed to get that, I've instinctively looked to blame myself for why that may be the case or the work that I've done. Has this ever happened to you? And if so, how have you kind of sought to deal with that? Yes, it's happened to me. Basically, creative partnerships come and go. Sometimes you have a journey with a person, with a collaborator for a few months, a few years, many years and drift apart. Sometimes there's a clear reason for it and sometimes there isn't. And I've always looked for a reason. I've always tried to understand what changed, what went wrong, what was the problem. And ultimately, I've not always been able to find the answer to that. And that is something that's painful and difficult because there are people I've collaborated with for quite long periods who I no longer work with. And hand on heart, I don't know why incredibly successful work, incredibly successful projects, great collaborations, where not only was the collaboration a great experience, well, I thought so, the end product, the end piece has ended up being, you know, awarded globally. And you don't always know why that phone doesn't ring again, you know, what that reason may be. And um, it is one of the mysteries. And I think it's just best not to dwell on these things and to kind of keep moving forward and building new relationships with new collaborators, new people to work with. I think, yes, psychologically, it's confusing and you want a clear answer. You want something. What did I do wrong? What was the problem with the way that I worked? Was it a creative difference? Was it a personal difference? What what was it? And ultimately, you have to just accept that you're, you're probably never going to find out the answer to that. With regards to those relationships ending is I think it's very important just not to put all your eggs in one basket. And it's like I said about the beginnings of my career, like trying to build relationships with different directors you're building this kind of stable of directors that you work with. And the more people you sort of loyal to and can be available for, the the less chance you have of suddenly being left with no no collaborators. It's a case of just not putting yourself just in one, with one person, because it's, it's dangerous to do that, you know? 
Yeah, spread your net far and cast your net far and wide, I suppose, and uh, you're more likely to get the fish. <laughs> I mean, that that's it ultimately. You, it's like backing horses, you know. Which of those directors that you're loyal to and work with? Like, there's there's directors that I worked with in the early days of my career who I was absolutely convinced would become, in their day, Oscar winning directors, and they're no longer even in the industry. So you know, you can't always back the right people. You try to. Who knows? Those same directors may return to the industry in 10 years. Who knows? I don't know. But don't spread yourself too thin and do spread yourself around and reach out to different people and find people whose work you like. Ultimately, then it's like I said earlier, it's like be selective in the type of work you're doing and it will breed more of the same type of work. And ultimately, then your work that you're doing starts to be more of a reflection of your own taste and your own sensibility. Yeah. It's interesting. I suppose as having that kind of relationship with many, many directors, it softens the psychological blow if one does take a different direction or leaves the industry. And I suppose if, you, if you're not solely reliant on one person, it's always going to help you mentally as well as with your career. Yeah, yeah, very much. So over the past decade, I've checked in with you a few times to ask you for advice and opinions, and you've had somewhat of a kind of mentor role with me, especially you've helped me with a lot of advice for the first and only feature that I shot, Trendy. What role have mentors played for you in your career, and how important do you think these relationships are for growth? I think mentorship within cinematography is essential, actually. And I was very fortunate in 2009 to meet Phil Mayhew, And he was incredibly supportive and became a mentor figure for me from then through till now. And that was an amazing relationship because suddenly I knew someone in the industry in the early days for me, you know, 2009, I was um, very much finding my feet as a cinematographer and being able to call on someone with the experience of having shot films like Casino Royale, Scum, The Long Good Friday, some of the best pieces of British cinema I ever made, in my opinion, was just invaluable. And it was an interesting relationship because I was never on set with Phil. I never visited set. I never saw him work. But he was someone I could call when I was in a scenario where I probably just needed validation for what I was doing. So as the scale of my productions got larger, I think I did my first million pounds commercial not long after that. And being able to call someone with Phil's experience level and talk him through what I was planning on doing, which at the, at the time was feeling larger scale than I felt comfortable with, and have him just go, no, David, everything you've said makes sense. Everything you're approaching makes sense. He helped me see that as I was scaling up in production size, you know, bigger locations, bigger lighting setups, bigger pressures, that I was doing things in the right way. And having that validation was very, very useful for me. And in return, for me, when I when I mentor others, I hope to offer them the support that they're making the right decisions themselves. I'm very rarely telling someone what to do. I'm just discussing what it is they're doing and why they're doing it and questioning their reasons for it and often saying, well, you know what, you're doing everything you should be doing. But I, hopefully that helps them have that knowledge of, you know, I've said I need 618Ks for this location, I do need 618 case. And, you know, that's what this location needs to be photographed. So what's the approach if you don't, if, if that's not possible, what do you do? Well, we scale everything down. We have to shoot a smaller part of the location. We have to shoot into a space that we can control. And I think having mentors that can offer you their sort of wealth of knowledge and maybe ways of saving money, maybe ways of, of saving time or I think navigating the politics of the industry is something very useful as well and something that we're not really taught. Well, I wasn't taught at film school. You know, suddenly, you know, you're going to have a crew, your team below you of 50 plus people, riggers and sparks and multiple camera teams and, and, you know, managing those people as a leader, having someone like Phil to call on for advice with those things is is very, very useful. Mm. I went to a talk by Phil actually about Casino Royale and yeah, it it must be great to have such a relationship with him. Yeah, he's he's an amazing and generous artist who has really helped me, really helped me. Yeah, it's great that there are people out there that's like that 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 far on the career and that generous with the knowledge and the time. It's it's lovely. It restores your faith in humanity. Uh, (laughs) So would you be happy to tell me about, in your opinion, what the biggest hurdle you've faced in your career is so far and what you've done to either manage that or overcome it? Wow, I've never been asked that. 
I think ultimately the biggest challenge I had was very much the early days. It was very much the fact I didn't have any connections into the industry. I didn't know anybody and I just moved to London. I couldn't pay my rent in the early days. So I used to sell coffee machines as freelance, get on set whenever I could. I'd go out as an assistant. I'd go out as a kit delivery driver. I'd go out operating whenever I could, get my hands on a camera. Ultimately, I just kicked and clawed my way in from the bottom. And that was the biggest challenge for me, was just trying to to build real relationships and be taken seriously because I didn't follow the classic route of trainee for years, loader, focus puller for years, and I didn't come through that way. I did go out as an assistant, but for a limited period of time. And um, through my documentary work, found myself shooting much earlier than I probably wanted to. But the reality was, if people are phoning you up saying, oh, you know, we've seen your film at so-and-so festival, we'd like you to shoot something for us. I mean, who can say no to that? It's like, no, I shouldn't because I need to assist for longer and I need to sell more coffee machines to pay my bills. You know, it's like, of course, I'm going to say yes to shooting your project. So that was a big challenge for me. And then, of course, coming into the industry in a slightly less conventional way, you know, struggling to be taken seriously as well in that respect. You know, you're building your knowledge as you go. You're learning as you go. I suppose that the approach that you took is nowadays a little bit more commonplace. You know, there are more people who are willing to kind of go that route. But for you at the time, you did it. When I first got a taste of the film industry in any sense was a few years after you did. And I got a sense when I first got a taste that there was very much a like hierarchical structure and this is the way things need to go in that in terms of like the order of your career and stuff and the, the I didn't see many people around that were doing kind of what you were doing where it was not loads of people it was like you it felt like your generation of DPs was the first that were sort of like really going at that in that way and not needing to kind of take years of being trainee assistant or somewhere else it's definitely something that's more normal more commonplace now Certainly. But that said, there's many very successful cinematographers years ahead of me that did the same. Um, You know, I think Anti-Dog Mantle is a very good example of someone who came straight out of film school and became a cinematographer. There are a number of occasions where that that sort of happened. But yeah, I I think something that's primarily different now is accessibility to the tools to create professional looking imagery are now widely available. And when I came out of film school in 2006, that wasn't the case. You know, if you wanted to shoot something properly, you really needed to be on film. Or if you could blag it, you could get your hands on like a F900R Sony HD cam or a 790p Sony. You know, those were the tools. It was like HD cam. Digibeta was still around a lot back then. You know, we're talking pre-Alexa, pre-RED. You could get your hands on a D21 if you could sweet to or carry. But to get imagery that would be to the level that one would consider to be professional, you really needed those tools. Whereas nowadays, and I think trying to demonstrate this with the the short I've just done, Cactus, with Luke Seymour and Joseph Bull, it's shot on a tiny Lumix DSLR. Ultimately, my goal there is to show that you can achieve this level of cinematography with very, very simple tools, if you're smart about the way you approach it, if you don't try to reinvent the wheel and don't try to be too ambitious with what you're doing, you can achieve very good results. And the fact is now with very cheap equipment, with the right knowledge, you can achieve very high end results. So I think that's making it easier for people to become cinematographers very quickly. But still the process of lighting, the process of the the technical knowledge required as a cinematographer into all the subgenres that we discussed earlier, whether it's miniatures or macro, high speed, motion control, whatever it is, just takes years to learn that stuff. And uh, I think everyone has their own journey, their own path. Yeah, that's a great, great answer to the question. So I love traveling for work, but you seem to travel more than anyone I know for work and have done for quite a while. Do you enjoy this aspect of your job and how do you manage the impact that it has on your life outside of work? I do travel a lot. I mean, this this year is a bit different because it's pandemic. So I think I've been to 14 countries this year, which Mm. um, is a lot. Still a reasonable amount. (laughs) It's still still, still a fair chunk of traveling. But normally I'm doing 20, 25 plus countries a year. And that's been the norm for 
a long time now. I love traveling. I'm quite comfortable living on the road. It can be nomadic at times, but I love seeing different cultures, different places. And for me, I find that exciting. I'm not someone who can stay in the same place for very long. It's a, it's a lifestyle choice. Um, I think I'm known as being a DP that travels a lot and I'm happy to. So I get a lot of traveling jobs because of that. I think producers and directors probably feel a comfort in the fact that I've shot in, I, I believe, someone asked me the other day, I believe it's 42 or 43 countries I've shot in now. So by doing that and proving that you can achieve a, a particular level of cinematography with crews you don't know in, in their entirety all over the world and continents, you know, all continents, there's a, a safety I think producers and directors probably feel knowing that you'll be fine working with not your crew, not your gaffer, not your focus puller, not your grip, that you'll make it work with whoever you're working with. And I think on a creative level, it's been very good for me because, I'm, you know, you lose that support network. Still sometimes end up working with incredibly talented uh, technicians all over the world, but sometimes you don't. Sometimes you are left with a crew who maybe are not at the level you might be used to working with in LA or London. And that means you're filling in the gaps. And that is very good for you as an artist. Don McAlpine said to me, a quote I've reeled off far too many times in interviews over the years. He said to me, calm seas never made a skilled sailor. And I can't think of a more perfect statement for what we do as cinematographers. Like, unless you've been in the shit, unless you've had it go wrong, you've had a generator blow up, you've had your lights go down, you've had a crane fail, but solved the situation and got through it and completed production. Unless you go through those things, you're not getting any better. You're not becoming better at problem solving and dealing with adverse circumstances. So for me, when shit hits the fan, the first thing I do is like, you know, step back and rather than just be angry at the situation, you just kind of be very calm and just think, you know, we're going to get through this. We're just making a production. You know, we're not saving lives here. And this will make me better as an artist. This will make me a better cinematographer, ultimately. Even the horror stories where, you know, we've, we've all had them. <laughs> well, I could probably, we could probably do a 24-hour podcast of yeah. things I've witnessed around the world. But it's been a very exciting thing for me to be sometimes surprised by, you know, the amazing abilities of crew and working with different gaffers and, and particularly gaffers, I'd say, around the world, like, their approaches, how they like to do things, the tools they like to use. And, you know, as I said before, we're always learning creatively, aesthetically, but also socially, the different ways different crews are managed in different countries. Keeps me fresh, I think, hopefully. <laughs> so with regards to like the impact that it kind of has outside of your work, is that something that just kind of like your friends and family at this stage have kind of, and, and you know, the people around you have just kind of got used to, that's your lifestyle now, because that's just something that you've been doing for so long. Yes, I think so. One thing I do spend years hammering home to my friends is please don't assume I'm away because that was where things got quite difficult was when you start missing social things when you actually are in London and then you find out about it on the night. You maybe see a, an Instagram post or a Facebook post and all your friends are out. And it's like, wait a minute, I'm stuck at home. Yeah. We thought you were away. We thought you were still in South America. It's like, no, 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 no. So basically what I say to all my friends is, you know, assume I'm here please assume I'm in London, like, because I may not be when you may think I'm not, but I might just arrive that morning. I might arrive that evening. Maybe I'm going to pop back just for a social event. And I, I think that's very important is you have to be extremely dedicated and you have to make a lot of sacrifices to sort of pursue a career in cinematography. I think that's no secret, but there does come a time where you have to prioritize life things. You have to prioritize friends, you have to prioritize family. And um, that's important. That's as important as the work itself doing that and I think you know you have to be you have to be strict to that what is your idea of success are you aiming for anything in particular you got anything in mind no I really don't see it that way as long as I'm working with good directors on projects that creatively excite me and interest me I'm happy as long as my work's being seen by the audience that it's designed for then I'm happy you know I don't have any aspirations particularly of goals for awards or exposure of particular type or a certain type of job or anything like that I just want to do the best work I can do with the best people I can work with and I like working with people who are nice I like working with kind people honest people calm people you know I think I take filmmaking very seriously 
but I also like to have fun. I like to keep it, you know, in good spirits and, and just remember every day how fortunate we are to work in the industry we work in and, uh, you know, be kind to people, be kind to my crew, be respectful to everyone around in all departments. And, uh, for me, that's, that's success. Joy in going to work every day, being excited by the projects I'm working on. That's success for me. So I'm very happy. And I've often said, I love, I love short form. I love shooting commercials and, and promos. And as much as I love shooting long form, I have no aspirations to be back to back shooting films all year. That's not me. It's, it's just, it will never will be me. I don't want that. And if that's not cinematography, then fine. But um, I'm very happy doing what I'm doing. So, Yeah. So success for you is it's an ongoing pursuit. It's not a, a light at the end of a tunnel or a, like a, a thing in the distance that you're aiming for. It's, a, it's the process, essentially. It's the process, yeah. I mean, I think ultimately it would be lovely to, to shoot something that I'm perfectly happy with, but I also know that that will never happen. I've learned that from all the cinematographers that, that come before me, my mentors, everybody around. You're never going to shoot a project that you step back from and say, I did everything right. Everything is, <laughs> I mean, I'm lucky, I'm lucky to shoot a single scene where I feel that way. I think it's important to do that. I, I mean, I can't imagine a, a cinematographer who just loves everything they do. That would be a, an awful, I think, balance as a human. I can't quite imagine yeah. that. But I think something yeah, we share. Surreal. <laughs> yeah, I, I think something we share <laughs> with cinematographers generally is that constant like questioning of our own work. And um, I don't need to even mention names, but some of the biggest, most successful cinematographers in the world share those same sentiments of, you're never happy. <laughs> yeah. It's never quite right. It's never quite how you dreamt it. Mm. It's human nature. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. I think, yeah, it's, although it's funny because I think there are other people in other industries doing creative work that don't seem to have so many, don't seem to be able to spot so many faults as cinematographers, but it's perhaps because of the required attention to detail and the fact that there is also quite a lot out of your hands when you're actually creating something as a cinematographer that it's never going to be quite exactly as you want because there's too much, there's too many moving parts, there's too many other people involved, there's too, too many things that change on the day, I suppose, that that shape it. So it can never be, like if you're painting a picture, you can imagine it and take forever to get it exactly how you want it to be and maybe restart it again. But in, in when you're making a film, there are all these restraints that require you to do it, do it then and get it done. Mm. I think something I find interesting is I find it easier to be happy with work where I've been less in control of it. And that's a maybe strange thing to say, but I think like where I'm collaborating with maybe an operator and so the actual composition and the actual exacting sort of flow of the camera is not in my hands. Maybe I'm working with an operator, I've lit the scene, but then it's graded without me being involved in a grade maybe by a very good colorist. And then I see the work and it's kind of two stages removed from myself. And then maybe I really like it because I see less of myself in it. I'm less critical of it because it's less mine. But that's something I find that I experience a huge amount as a, as a cinematographer is witnessing cognitive dissonance in directors. And it's something that I've never been able to do myself, which is annoying because I think it would help me creatively. And what I mean by that is, let's say you've tech scouted a location. It's, you know, beautiful sunshine. You plan the whole shoot around this lovely low backlight for a whole setting of the scene. Um, you turn up on the shoot day and it's cloudy. And it's, it is what it is. Nature's made its decisions. So you shoot in the clouds. And what I can say happens 99% of the time is the directors will be at the monitor and over the course of the scene will go from, oh God, I can't believe it's not sunny. Oh, look at the tech scout photos. Oh man, this is not what I really thought it was going to be. Like through the shooting of the scene, maybe through the day, they warm to, you know what? I think it's more, I think it's more unique that it's cloudy. <laughs> actually, you know what? I never expected it to be like this, but actually I think it's better. I think it's like, it's less obvious. It's more, it's more unique. And you're there just going, yeah, 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 cool. Um, <laughs> generally, I'm still thinking, no, it should be sunny. 
It should be sunny. Um, <laughs> but but this, this is the thing that I witness with directors a huge amount, is this cognitive distance of like adapting to the, the reality of a situation and accepting it and embracing it. And it's actually, it's a survival cope, it's a coping mechanism, it's a survival mechanism. Every variant of that I find with directors, like, and it's fascinating because, you know, psychologically that relationship between me and a director is a very, very interesting one. And uh, I often come away from it. And listen, sometimes I'll be like, yeah, maybe it's better it's cloudy. But hmm. one out of a hundred times, generally I'm just, you know, no, nah, it, it should have been sunny. But I'm going to go with that. I'm going to disagree. Yep, yep, it's yeah, yeah, it's cloudy. <laughs> so they ever see through your agreement and realize that you're not, that you don't actually believe that and they try and persuade you? I'm sure they see through it every single time. I'm, <laughs> I'm a terrible actor. I'm sure I'm just there, just like, yeah, 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 it's better. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, I think it's what we do as filmmakers. We're constantly adapting to situations. You know, there's so much out of our control within a production. You have to be adaptive at all times. You know, the weather's one small example of something you can't control. But even in a studio environment, you have a certain amount of control of cast. But at the end of the day, they're their own living, breathing humans. And if they their performance goes a different direction on set on the day, a director can try and control that as much as they want to, but ultimately, it's such a collaborative thing we do. The, the, the end result will never be quite as planned. Maybe it's better, maybe it's different, maybe it's worse. You know, mm -hmm. it's the process, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. So you kind of touched on some advice that you received earlier, but I was just wondering if you could share the best advice that you've ever received in your career, if you have any, that someone has passed to you that you'd be uh, happy to share. I mean, in terms of advice, I'd have to revisit what, what I said earlier from Don McAlpine, which was calm seas never made a skilled sailor. It's that, yeah. it's that process of understanding that things will not always go to plan. You know, you are going to traverse rough seas as a cinematographer. Things are going to go wrong. You are going to have untold amount of challenges that you could not have foreseen coming. But ultimately, if you can do something about it, do something about it. And if you can't, then don't worry about it. You know, we're not miracle workers. No one's expecting you to achieve the impossible. And, um, you know, these challenges, these, these things we go through, they make us better as, as cinematographers. I think many people have said to me over my career, you know, just to be as calm as possible, to think calmly about every situation, but also not to overthink things. I mean, that's something I think many people, many people do is, is overthink situations. And you hear of people who can't sleep before a shoot. You know, I really, you know, people saying they really struggle to, to sleep on the night before a shoot because they're just running everything through in their head, thinking about what if this goes wrong? What if this happens? What if this goes wrong? The reality is that's it's pointless to do that. So don't do it. And, you know, maybe your process of stopping doing that is takes some, some doing. But ultimately, I'm never going to be awake before a shoot because if there's something I can do about a situation, if there's something that's not been done, I'm going to I'm going to deal with it. And if there's a problem on the day that arises that was not foreseen, you're surrounded by the best team you can have around you, whether it be production and your entire camera grip, lighting, rigging team, everyone's there to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. If it's a problem, you would have foreseen it earlier and already solved it, wouldn't you? Then if, if it was something new, so you can't like imagine on the night before that there's going to be some disaster because the disaster that will happen, you could just could you could never predict. It, it's always the sideways thing that you just couldn't have foreseen that would happen on the day, and you've just got to like deal with it. That's right. You can't predict unbelievable things that may or may not go wrong on a shoot. Generally, if they can go wrong, they will go wrong. We know that much. But if you can fix it, fix it. If you can't, you can't. You know, we do our best. And I think, I think something else, one thing I would say is, I can't remember who did tell me this, but ultimately something we deal with a huge amount as cinematographers is rejection, is that moment where you think you've landed the dream job, the pivotal job in your career, and, and it goes away. You lose it. Someone else gets it. Maybe the job disappears. Any manner of reasons could mean you're no longer involved in a production. And it's, it's moving forward from that and not dwelling on it and... For me, it's that essence of, I'm not getting spiritual, but it's like everything happens for a reason. It's like something else will happen that wouldn't have happened if you'd done that project. And it's a case of the three or four big product productions that fell through before I did Black Beauty. Had any of those happened, I would not have been able to do Black Beauty. And at the time, I just couldn't find reason in those projects falling through. They were so big and so exciting. 
I just felt frustrated and upset. But the reality is you just look forward and, and think to yourself, you know, another project's going to come. Another project will come and find reason in, in, in not doing that thing. And rather than being frustrated, just be positive about, well, okay, it wasn't meant to be, something else will come. So someone definitely said that to me once. And uh, I've said that to others now. I think it's very relevant. What gives you hope? I think what gives me hope is I don't like most cinematography. I don't like most TV shows I watch. I don't like most films I watch. I don't like most music videos I watch. There's a very specific type of cinematography that I like, that I really respond to. And for me, that has been something that's always funneled away a lot of the competition in the industry for me. You know, it's a very broad, brutally competitive industry. But ultimately, I've never looked at it in quite that way. I've always thought, well, actually, there's only a handful of people doing work that I really like. So I'm competing with the handful of people. It's like that work, when I see that work, excites me. That makes me feel energized and excited and hopeful for projects that I can be part of and stories I can tell. That probably is my answer there. Um, you know, it's the inspiration of seeing other people's amazing work and aspiring to do work as good as that, that one day I can do work as good as that. Thank you so much for, for chatting to me. It's been really interesting to chat to you and thanks for being so honest and open about your experiences. I really appreciate it. I hope it's, uh, it's been enjoyable for you too. Yeah, it's really lovely talking. Thank you. Find us online at visiongraft.com and for updates, follow Will on Instagram at visiongraft.